Today we are going to talk about photo lithography, one of the most important topics to where we are today. And it's not exactly touched up by many people, so I thought I will introduce this topic to you. Okay, so what is photo lithography? We are printing with light. So we are using light as a knife to cut. Simpler way to look at it. If you remember our unsung heroes, right? Uh, Jay Lathrop and uh, James North. In one of the earlier chip stories, we talked about them. Kind of refresh that story one more time. And so both of them uh, were at MIT. They were working in a government lab. And eventually Lathrop uh, joined uh, TI. Again, roots going back to TI, right? And uh, Bob Noyce. The problem he was solving was earlier, what they were doing was they were putting different, different transistors as units and then they were trying to wire to now we wanted to plenarize everything so that's when this whole thing started right literally there is not much material about lathrop and Nol. Nol, though there is no picture anywhere i i searched all over the place because i like to look into history but lathrop he's a i mean he looks like a cowboy right um, so i found this one picture of him uh, maybe he had a horse farm or something uh, probably and the key idea that they came up with which is very interesting, right? Do you remember the key idea of Lathrop? Was when you use a microscope, okay, you are looking at the microscope from top and you are seeing a tiny thing. So he flipped it around. He said, what if I flip the microscope? So I will shine a big thing and it will make it really tiny. Okay, so that's exactly what they did. Here, what we are seeing is, uh, you know, on the top of the microscope, I'm showing a big image and that gets concentrated or tinier when it goes to our chip. Right? Because we are trying to go smaller, smaller, smaller. You know, microscopes function is to make things look larger. So they, they kind of, I mean, it's a very radical thought at that time, if you remember, right? So this is what he did. And what was the, they were using visible light. Simple enough, right? So visible light, you could see. He kind of figured out the chemicals that he wanted to use, which were done by Kodak, um, lenses, everything, right? So he figured it all out. And they kind of got into production, literally, with that, right? I want to kind of dig down deeper so that you have a better appreciation for this okay so be with me on this so i'm just showing you a very simple image here first the top piece that you're seeing there the hash piece right that is our um, substrate silicon substrate and then we take a silicon substrate if you remember that disc that i brought in the one that i was holding in tsmc proudly with 18 inch wafer right that kind of thing so you coat it with a photoresist what is a photoresist photoresist has a property that if it's exposed to light Either it softens or hardens, depending upon whatever quality. We, we are not looking at that detail, but just for simplicity, you coat it with this red photoresist, okay? And then you expose it with light. Now here, the black piece that you're seeing, the two black pieces, that is called mask, okay? Mask will be, will be masking the light. It will not let the light go through. So that's one piece. So you're creating a high resolution uh, patterns on silicon. Of course, important, if I want to make transistors smaller, 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 what's important? Mask has to be, you have to create masks which are of a higher quality because the mask has to be able to uh, get you that nanometer type of definition. If the mask is no good, then nobody can help you, right? So interestingly, my wife used to work, my wife Sarita, she used to work in a company called uh, Photronics, which is which actually makes the masks. So very advanced level masks. So they are doing at that time. Yeah, and yet another interesting part is many of my chips are processed by her company and I'm sure she was part of the, you know, the mask making business at that time. Although I never told her the, the sequence number of my chip so that, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So the next thing is, what's the next most important thing is the light source, okay? So what are the two important things? One is the mask. The mask will let you, how close can I go? But then at certain point, the mask gets so small, right? The light has to pass through that. And it can get diffracted and all that. So, so that's a major science about how to do that. But I'm kind of simplifying it so that uh, the things are pegged in your head in terms of what to look for. So two important things. Remember, what is it? Quality of the mask. And the second one is light source. Remember light source. Okay. Now, when uh, Lathrop was doing it, he was using visible light. To improve our resolution, you have to improve the light source. Okay. So how do you improve the light source? The light source has something called wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the better is the resolution. That's all you have to remember right now for this discussion. Okay. Again, you know, light source, I like to say, you know, and here you are seeing uh, the visible light. Okay. And that's been expanded completely. And after the visible light to the left, 
as the wavelength reduces, you go into ultraviolet and then X-rays and all those things, okay. Now here is a kind of in one slide, uh, you will see the struggle of the entire world, hmm? where we are going with this, right. So that's why I wanted to show you this. So first one, when Lathrop was doing, they were using mercury vapor lamps. So this mercury vapor lamp, of course, very expensive. It gave like this uh, light of wavelength 436 nanometer. And then that enabled a resolution of one micron. Okay, so the middle number is the wavelength of the light. The last number is the, what is the resolution of pattern that I can define. And in a way, that's kind of telling you, I can do a gate uh, length of one micron. Okay. Now, obviously, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce the wavelength, correct, as much as possible. The second wavelength was invisible UV. So we are going towards UV light and that was 0.2 micron. So that enabled 0.2 micron. So from 1 micron, we went to 0.2 micron. And the next one was again um, a krypton fluoride laser. And this sounds totally cool, right? Uh, I don't know if you have seen the Superman movies and things like that. There is a kryptonite business and all that stuff. So, so these are all, uh, you know, the, the periodic table you have seen certain elements, right? They are all used into this space, right? So krypton, krypton fluoride, it's not a toothpaste, okay? So just uh, kind of remember that. So this gives you deep UV light and that will give you a resolution of 0 0.08, which is 80 nanometers. That's what we're going to get. The last one was uh, argon fluoride laser. And that enabled almost 2.03 uh, uh, or 38 nanometer type of resolution. So this all this business was going on. So people were really trying hard. Um, the struggle was how do I create this light in a reliable manner? That is a key struggle. Okay, so key, remember that. It's not like, ha, chalo, ye order kia laser and you get it. Right? That, none of that was available. You had visible light and you had mercury vapor lamps and then you slowly tried to do. So remember, we are going to the... Uh, to the left side hmm, in our light spectrum and if you are able to get let's say the gamma rays right wonderful right but then what is the problem with gamma ray they go through everything right I cannot even have a mask which will uh, prevent uh, gamma ray right I mean you have gone for x-ray right and for x-ray to protect what do you do you wear that that big shield right so then um, we cannot do that on a chip the gamma rays will go straight through okay so it doesn't work so you are trying to just get far enough to get a better and better resolution. So extreme UV light, hmm? so is 13 nanometer wavelength. That's where the dream come to us. So everybody wanted to go to extreme UV light. Now, at that time, there were three companies, Canon, Nikon, and ASML. And ASML, I'm going to tell you all about it, right? So these three companies were there, and uh, all these things required tons of money. Hmm? And this is not something trivial, right? Uh, you, you think about... Uh, foundry, it requires a lot of money. Just to create one machine requires a lot of money here, okay, when you are going down here in this path. So Canon and Nikon said, nah, it's too expensive. Uh, they didn't want to go through, I mean, they had their own thought process about how they wanted to go about it and they thought the world was not ready. So they decided not to pursue EU, EUV. And automatically what happened? ASML became the de facto contender for, uh, for this particular job. So 13 nanometer wavelength light is what extreme UV light is what we need to do. Uh, let's talk about ASML. So ASML, you know, Advanced Semiconductor Materials Lithography. That's the name of the company. This is how it got started. Now, I just want to show you the picture. And I specifically like something that's on the right middle. You know, it almost looks like IIT Bombay. They have those dabbas where people work. Uh, you work inside a container. Right? If you run out of space, then you go inside a container and you work in the container. And then there is another container is outside which is showing a lot of stuff in that container, right? Huh? So you see that, uh, that that's where they started, okay? ASML got started. So very humble beginnings, 1984. So Philips, it spun out of Philips. So Philips was doing this mask business. So this whole group was spun out of uh, Philips. Industry was in dire straits at that time. The other mask are making uh, other companies which were in that space, they were going belly up. And then that's when these guys were born, ASML. What they decided to do was uh, they took a different approach. Now it looks all easy for me to say it, but at that time, uh, you know, people didn't see it that way. So they said that we will not invent anything. We will just take stuff from all the people and then we will put it all together and make sure that we perform to the highest. So that was their strength. 
So they were a really super skilled integrator. Okay, so they took technology from all over the world and then they put it together. Location was Netherlands. So this was the second thing that's going for them. So Netherlands, everybody loved Netherlands because it's Netherlands, right? It's a neutral venue. It's like Switzerland. So nobody messed with them. You know, everybody was friendly with them and everybody trusted them. So for example, United States trusted them. For example, um, Taiwan trusted them. For example, all the Europe companies, they trusted them. So everybody trusted them. So that was a great benefit for Netherlands to be there, okay, in that time point. Hmm? And then both TSMC and ASML, if you remember, they were all, both of them got their roots were with Philips because TSMC got the technology from Philips when Maurice Chang, you know, really kind of worked on them and uh, they got the technology. Similarly, ASML also technology came from Philips. Okay, now worldwide at that time, uh, there was like only one contender who could run. Canon and Nikon, they were inventing everything in-house. Now such a complex system cannot be invented by one company. So, you know, they were struggling, so they didn't want to pursue UV path. ASML was the only one. It's like there is only one person in the entire world who's running, right? And everyone else is feeding that guy or girl to keep running, right? That's exactly what was going on. And they were running for almost 20 years, ASML, to get to this point. So you can imagine the amount of money that has been pumped into ASML by the entire world so that they would succeed. So the desire was somehow uh, we have to succeed at EUV. Otherwise, Moore's law will fail. Huh? And then we will not make progress. That was the thought process. So Intel uh, kept giving them billions and billions of dollars. We are not even talking about millions of dollars. Billions, okay? And all the state secrets, like United States had, they had done a lot of work in this phase. They were okay with giving it to Netherlands and try giving it to us, right? That will be a lot of conditions and all that stuff. But they were happy to give it to Netherlands. Netherlands is a neutral venue. Okay, okay, you do it. You do it. We develop it type of thing. So that was the whole thing. And uh, one of the only contenders was Silicon Valley Group. Uh, it wasn't doing that well, but it had a lot of technology. They all got gobbled up by ASML. EUV is an ultra difficult problem to solve. And now you will see what I mean by ultra difficult. Right? You will have appreciation for it. So first is uh, you need a light source. It's a light source for uh, for this particular thing. So there is a company in San Diego from UCSD. There are a couple of professors so who had a company called Simer. And this particular company, they created light source. So the idea was you take tin droplets and you hit them with super high speed with a laser. Huh? So you hit them twice. This is totally interesting, right? I mean, talk about technology. So you have one drop, you hit it twice. The first time the droplet becomes a puppet, flat. And the second second hit will make it plasma. And the temperature increases almost to more than the sun's temperature. That's what is going on. And then once this plasma is created, then the, the light that you need, the 13 nanometer uh, light that we want, that will be created. Okay. Now, who's going to hit that dr tiny droplet, right? So you need a laser. So they contacted basically this company, Trump. And um, this is a German company. And they were, you know... German technology, you know, they were really good at this piece. So they were doing the laser. So they figured out how to do the carbon dioxide laser, CO2 laser. The issue there was not just do the, the laser part. The 80% of the energy was in heat. So how do you remove heat? So you have to remove the heat at a very high speed. So you need high speed fans. The fans couldn't be running off a motor. So they have to be floating in magnets type of thing. So a lot of innovation which happened over there to remove the heat out of the laser, get the laser out. And then this high power laser, so they had these resonators which will amplify the power of the laser. So all that cool stuff that they did. Um, and then you have to transport that laser to where you are going to print wherever the light source is needed, right? So that was another technology that Trump did. Uh, to channel this laser, they had to invent new type of diamonds, you know, ultra clean diamonds. Uh, so ultra pure diamonds to channel these lasers. You can see how much innovation that went into. And the last piece was uh, Zeiss, which is a German technology uh, company. And you had to, you know, imagine this, right? You create light source somewhere and then you have to pipe that light source somewhere else, right? So you have to use mirrors. The Zeiss company, they what they did is they created this molybdenum uh, silicon wave, uh, silicon reflectors. And they were so good that you could literally uh, hit an uh, ant on the moon. That, that kind of uh, accuracy they were doing. And all this stuff requires reliability, remember. Because you have to do this in and out, in and out, constantly to churn out the chips. And here is uh, the picture from ASML. 
right? The the stuff that you're seeing on the right side, it's how that laser is traveling all over the place, right? All those things that they're putting together. It's a very impressive machine that they have created. Each machine has half a million parts, okay? Uh, wrap your head around. We are talking about half a million transistors and here is a machine which has half a million parts, okay? Each machine costs about hundred million dollars. The next thing is extreme reliability because you can't fail. If you have one part, it's easy to design for no failure. If you have two parts, suddenly the probability of failure increases. If you have three parts, four parts, huh, you can, you know what the probability of failure is, right? Main time. And if you have half a million parts, talk about probability of failure, right? Every second thing will fail. But they had designed it in such a way that it doesn't fail. Because as soon as it fails, the half a million times number of seconds it's off, machine is off, right? That's a loss that the company is going to incur. So reliability is very critical. So this is one of the most expensive production level machine that has been produced in the world. Okay, most expensive. Of course, you will say rocket ship, but rocket is not a production. It's only one rocket or whatever. Right? These guys are producing this day and hour. Okay, I hope you appreciate, um, you know, what they have achieved. And uh, so this became now, ASML became, uh, it's kind of the focal point of the entire world. Right? I'm making you walk through certain path. Right? I, I told you that the TSMC, huh, TSMC, 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 TSMC has all the, but ASML is the new king. I hope you appreciate that because without ASML, you cannot print nanometer parts. ASML is not, I mean, although it's a single company, but all the technology that's in that company is coming from everywhere in the world. Okay, so a lot of stuff came from US, uh, Germany, uh, and talk about collaboration between variety of people. And they, there is an interesting uh, talk from the CEO. The CEO used to threaten people. Okay, I'm kind of exaggerating to make a point. Let's say Simer is the company, right? Uh, they are producing these lasers, uh, the light source. And if they don't do a good job, if they don't deliver on time, then his threat was, I will acquire you. Right? And you will be assimilated. And that really happened. Many of the companies who didn't perform to the expectations, they got acquired. And then ASML ran them successfully because their goal was not just to get one piece. They had to get this half a million parts worth of machine working flawlessly. Software was a big important piece in this whole thing. Okay? Worldwide locations of ASML. Okay? Do you see something that's happening here? So in India, we don't have a facility. So I think it's one of the most important things that we need to get inside our country um, for our progress. Uh, we are focused on printing, but I think uh, we need to look at the source also so that we get stronger and stronger in this space. That's all I have for Chipstore. Thank you.